Uh, we'll have Mike German. Mike German is going to present an overall picture of surveillance of dissent. He's also going to talk about dissent in other states, including Maryland. In addition, he'll be discussing privatizing intelligence, a frightening concept. Also, recent Department of Justice report on the FBI that discusses the Thomas Merton Center and a number of other topics he'll be dealing with, including the material support issue, which is, again, quite frightening. Uh, let me just talk briefly, I think briefly about Mike German. He's a former FBI agent who now works for the National ACLU in its Washington, D.C. office. And it doesn't say this, but what it means is that he apparently had an epiphany and came up to the good guys and the good women. <laughs> Without further ado, Mike German. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks to all the sponsoring agencies uh, who put this together, and thank all of you uh, for coming out. Yeah, you know, it's a really uh, impressive showing of concern about this issue, and unfortunately, it's something that I've had to do in a, a number of different communities over the past several years uh, as we've been looking into how uh, this uh, type of intelligence activity, which, you know, as Paul explained, has never been absent. Uh, it has always been here, uh, and yet has been uh, very much fueled uh, post 9-11. And, you know, as Paul kind of said, you know, it was always happening, but it was at the fringes of the law or in violation of the law and regulations uh, prior to 9-11 and the Patriot Act and some other uh, attorney general guidelines and other regulations that were put in after the, the COINTELPRO abuses of the 1960s and the Red Squads of the 1970s and 80s were uncovered. And all those uh, uh, legal restraints that were put on to ensure that this would not happen again, uh, it would, you know, the, the intelligence community was never very happy about those restraints and uh, used events as they came up as reasons to uh, loosen them and loosen them and loosen them until finally they're at a point literally now where they don't exist. Uh, the uh, ACLU uh, issued a number of Freedom of Information Act requests in, in 2004, 2005, and 2006 uh, of joint the FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force operations because there was this feeling that, that activists were being uh, uh, surveilled and, and spied upon. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> You know, it, it's interesting, it was before I was at the ACLU, and, and it really seemed, uh, looking back on it, that it was sort of a, a shot in the dark. You know, we think these groups are, so we'll do these FOIAs. And, you know, almost invariably, what they found is every group that they FOIAed for was, in fact, being uh, surveilled. And uh, unbeknownst to us, that initiated a, an IG investigation in 2006 that just concluded <laughs> in uh, October of 2010, so quite a while. That investigation, you know, took forever to get done, and it's really quite revealing. Um, have, have anybody here ever read a, a Department of Justice Inspector General uh, investigative report or audit? Of course. I don't know. Um, you know, the, the Department of Justice Inspector General, Glenn Fine, is one of the, the most effective inspector generals in, in the federal government, and I would urge you to go to his website uh, and, and read some of the reports. He has reports on all Department of Justice agencies, and particularly the FBI. Uh, it's literally, you know, dozens of these reports, and it's really a fascinating read. Uh, they're extremely detailed. Uh, and they all have an executive summary and a conclusion. And most reporters, when they come out, and, and you know, other people, you know, trying to get the story out quickly, read that conclude or the conclusion and the executive summary, and, and, and you know, that's most of what everybody reads. But the details are really what's important. Uh, because what he concluded with the, the Thomas Merton Center, PETA, Greenpeace, uh, and some other groups that, that were uncovered by the, the ACLU FOIAs was that uh, the FBI did not target these groups for their political beliefs. That was his conclusion. But if you actually read the details, what he says was because the Attorney General guidelines that limited the FBI's investigative authority were relaxed in 2002, all that was necessary for the FBI to start an investigation was the possibility that an individual or a group 
could commit a criminal act in the future. Now, of course, it, we're all possible criminals. You know, there's always a possibility that one of us might commit a crime. And what the Inspector General did not do was go back and say, okay, out of the pool of all the possible criminals, why did the FBI choose these groups? And I think the only conclusion would have been because of their political beliefs. And he made it very clear when he went into the detail of the different investigations that there was no factual basis support to support those investigations. That, you know, whatever factual basis that was alleged was often after the fact. In other words, the FBI didn't document why it was starting the investigation with any factual basis. It was a sort of post hoc when the IG came calling. Why did you do that? Oh, we thought there was this possibility. And sort of putting uh, the facts together afterwards. So it's really a chilling read, and it shows you know, just how low the standards have, have fallen to what justifies the investigation. Another important point about it, he, he revealed that many of the activists that, that were actually investigated, uh, there was no factual basis or only speculative facts, whether they had, had engaged in something. Sometimes these investigations last for years, and, you know, even during the investigation, no facts were ever uncovered that they posed any kind of threat, and yet the investigation was renewed on, on a regular basis. And one key thing is that, that once you are subject to an FBI investigation like that, you are put on the terrorist watch list, regardless of the fact that there was no factual basis to support the fact that these people were a threat to anyone, much less a threat to the ADHD. So it does have an impact, and you know that sometimes people say, well, if you're not doing anything wrong, what do you have to worry about? I would suggest they go and talk to those activists who did have their travel impeded and did, you know, create a serious risk whenever they had any sort of interaction with law enforcement. So this is a serious thing. This isn't, you know, uh, uh, something that, that does not have harm. There are real harms that come from this, in addition to the, the uh, chilling of your First Amendment rights. So this is something that I think we have to make sure that our elected representatives understand is that this is not without it victims. This is a victimless crime. There are victims of this crime that's got to stop. Um, it's also, uh, you know, unfortunately when, when these events happen around the country, you know, you may uh, know from last year that the ACLU of Maryland uncovered uh, a Maryland State Police spying operation that targeted uh, 53 activists and put them uh, in, a, in a federal database listed as terrorists, even though there was no factual basis to support such an allegation. Uh, uh, it, you know, the investigation again went on several years, um, involved undercover operatives being sent into to meetings with the, the various groups to collect intelligence. Again, you know, during the course of the investigations, no information was ever uncovered suggesting anybody was doing anything illegal. Um, and, you know, it, I mean, interestingly, to justify it at one point, uh, when once the investigation started, um, apparently one of the Maryland State Police officials told the uh, former attorney general who was investigating the issue that, uh, well, the reason we continued is we thought it was good training for the undercover operative uh, because we knew she couldn't get hurt. Well, of course she couldn't get hurt because she's into groups that aren't engaged in the kind of violence and criminality. But that should have been a clue as to why that investigation was completely unjustified and, and illegal and unnecessary and wasn't going to produce any uh, uh, evidence of criminality. Um, but every time one of these is uncovered, much like it is here, you know, there's a very, you know, initial uh, focus on, on this independent activity, independent from the larger network. So what I want to make sure you're aware of is that, you know, this, this spying activity that, as Paul said, isn't new, is new in that it's been formalized and that the, that the network of spying activity has been formalized. And it's formalized in a number of different ways which create this, this um, web of surveillance that's not just the federal government, it's not just the state government, it's not just the local government, but it's also private companies. And one of the things that we've tried to do to educate uh, the public on that is uh, we revamped our Spy Files website. So if you go to 
uh, www.aclu.org slash spy files, what you'll see is, is a number of narratives, and, and you can uh, click on it. It has a lot of the documents that have been covered, uncovered through our FOIA requests. It has narratives explaining how all these uh, operations are tied together uh, within the different agencies. Uh, and it has recent news articles, so it's continually updated so you can see what's going on around the country. And uh, on the side, you'll see their attacks, so you can click on the Department of Defense and see how the military is increasingly involved in domestic intelligence operations. You know, we uncovered a program called Talent uh, that was spying on anti-war protesters, and that, you know, the, the organization that was doing that, it was called CIFO, was closed down, but the intelligence activity continues. The data was simply moved over to the FBI and the operations moved over to the Defense Intelligence Agency. So, you know, these, these what we don't want to see is when these uh, scandals erupt, that they're just sort of lost in, 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 in the local area, that we have to tie them all together. So that's the purpose of this site. Um, and part of the reason we're doing that is because these organizations are tying their activities together through these intelligence platforms, one being the Joint Terrorism Task Force that we looked at that brings in, you know, it's organized by the FBI, but it brings in the military, the CIA, uh, state and local law enforcement. Uh, there are also state and local fusion centers. How many people here have heard of fusion centers? Not enough. I'm not doing my job. What was it? They're called fusion centers. <clears throat> yeah. And these uh, are an interesting development uh, that has really caught on over the last several years. Uh, and a lot of federal money is going into their development. Uh, but they're actually state and local operations, sometimes regional operations. So the federal government is basically saying, you know, this isn't ours. Much like this incident with ITRR. Uh, you know, the federal government, you're not hearing them come in and say, yeah, you know, this was our fault. We never should have given a lot of Department of Homeland Security money to this Office of Homeland Security and not monitored what was being done with it. You know, of course, they're not taking responsibility. Just like in Maryland, they weren't taking responsibility when these people's names were listed as terrorists in a federal database. They said, well, even though it's our database, it's not our responsibility. It's the state police who are putting the information in as responsibility. So we want to have the information. We want to collect the intelligence. You know, we want the private company to be able to give the, the you know, it's almost like, a, I've called it a surveillance laundry. You know, the federal government gives money to the state government, which hires a private company, which does intelligence collection, which goes back up to the state, which goes back up to the federal government. So they all benefit from this illegal collection, an inappropriate collection, uh, and then when somebody is caught, they claim they're not responsible for it. And, and you know, we, we had that happen in Maryland where, uh, because of the scandal, there were uh, congressional requests for information about where, where this information about these people went, and the Department of Homeland Security came out and said, we have no information, on, you know, we collected nothing from this, don't know anything about it, and as the FOIA against the Maryland State Police continued, we uncovered information where there were Maryland State Police files saying this came from the Department of Homeland Security. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, and sort of two possibilities. One, you know, that they were trying to cover up that they were providing information, or two, which is, you know, in my experience, uh, probably more likely, is they don't know what they know, you know, and they don't really have enough accountability over what it is that's happening in these intelligence centers to even know where the flow of information is going. Uh, there was a fusion center in Maryland that claimed not to know anything about this two-year terrorism investigation. Now, the fusion centers are set up to... Uh, to we, we still don't know what a fusion center is. Okay. A, a fusion center is... And the official definition is any two agencies can decide to get together and share intelligence information, whether those agencies are federal, state, local, whether they're law enforcement or non-law enforcement, and can call themselves a fusion center. They can also involve private parties, so private companies can be involved in the fusion centers. Uh, there are no regulations governing their activities. 
They have Department of Justice resources as well as Department of Homeland Security resources. Often have FBI and DHS agents within the fusion centers, uh, but ostensibly under the, some state or local control. Only it's difficult because when we've gone to state and local legislatures and argued that you know you have to regulate these entities, they say, well, it's all federal money, so how can we possibly regulate them? You know, so it's sort of this again, this laundering of of responsibility uh, and creating this environment where because all these agencies are working together, they can seamlessly collect and share information without having any accountability for, for who's in charge of what's going on or really what regulations apply. I mean, there's often a difference between, you know, the privacy regulations at the local level, at the state level, and at the federal level. And, you know, what we don't want to see and what we're afraid is happening at these centers is, you know, if, if I'm the federal government and my rules say I can't collect this, but I know the local rules say they can, much like Paul said with bringing in the state police, you know, I'll let the, the state police collect it. And then when a Freedom of Information Act request comes in demanding some public accountability, they can say, well, the documents aren't, you know, because my FOIA rules are more, uh, would, would compel me to release them, I'll give them to what entity has the most restrictive release rules so that we can sort of, uh, you know, find, find the policies that allow the most liberal collection and the most restrictive dissemination of information. And again, with private companies involved, with the military involved in, in many of these fusion centers, uh, and, and very little access to information about what they're doing. Uh, we have a number of reports about fusion centers up on the website. You can read more about them uh, there. Oh, okay. Uh, so, you know, because this is being formalized in these centers, it's very hard uh, to stop it, you know, and, and uh, you know, I, I've gone traveling out to a lot of fusion centers and, you know, I'm sure some of them are trying to do things the right way, but because they're part of a network, you know, the network is only as good as the worst operator. And when we first started warning about these, uh, we really didn't have a lot of evidence in the public sphere about what was happening, but since then a number of reports have come out that are, are read very similar to these ITRR reports uh, where they to do target uh, activists uh, often with, you know, incredibly erroneous information and uh, it's very damaging to the groups involved uh, in their efforts to, uh, to accomplish the, the political goals that they're uh, involved in and, and to make sure that they can recruit membership. So, you know, again, this isn't a, a victimless um, type of activity. It's, uh, very damaging in a lot of ways. Um, uh, so, so, you know, going on to the website, you can see how the, all these different activities are collected, connected and how all the information is retained somewhere. So, you know, it, I, I mean, it was interesting here in Pennsylvania that all these uh, reports went up on the internet so people can actually read them uh, and see what their tax dollars are being spent on. Uh, and, you know, hopefully that we can start to bring in, a, you know, not just the dozens of groups that, that were actually victims of this, but that we realize that all of us are victims of this. And that, you know, once dissent is suppressed against anyone, it's, it's, it's suppressed against all of us. Uh, so, um, you know, we just have to keep working to, to uncover what's happening. And, you know, I think our best opportunities today uh, have to do with, the amount of money that's being spent on these things. You might have read in the Washington Post uh, uh, expose called Top Secret America that uh, revealed this you know, expansive uh, surveillance enterprise that's going on uh, and, and you know, involving a tremendous number of private companies. Uh, you know, something like 800,000 people are employed in this surveillance industry. Uh, so this is a growing phenomenon, and it is almost without regulation at this point. You know, one of the interesting things about the Inspector General report on the FBI's spying is he was complaining about the, you know, the, the lowering of standards is what allowed this activity to happen. You know, the fact that you lowered it to, to 
only the mere possibility of crime allowed the investigation, uh, is what opened the door to this abuse. Well, what he just briefly covered was the fact that in 2009, or 2000, December of 2008, right before the Obama administration took over, Attorney General Mukasey all but eliminated the guidelines uh, limiting FBI investigations to literally now the FBI needs no factual basis to start in what they call an assessment, which allows them to do all the types of activity that, that we're talking about with these reports. Physical surveillance, uh, uh, sending informants in, tasking informants, and even using undercover operatives, uh, in, you know, using agents who are, are hiding their identity so that they can gather information about you. And there was just recently uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation uncovered a document at DHS that was talking about how uh, agents could use Facebook to gather information about immigrants. So, you know, this is becoming, it, it has always been around, but it's becoming pervasive and it's becoming formalized in a way that, that we cannot protect ourselves. So it's up to our elected representatives to uncover this, to demand some accountability over it, to put regulations back up that would require a factual suspicion, reasonable suspicion of criminality before these uh, entities can do any of these uh, types of surveillance activity.